everybody. Today's practice problem comes from Principles of Microeconomics, 6th edition by N. Gregory Mankiw. Today we're going to be doing chapter 6, problem number 10. The problem begins as follows. It says, at Fenway Park, home of the Boston Red Sox, seating is limited to 39,000. I don't know if that's exactly correct, but it's in the neighborhood of correct nowadays, so let's just go with that. Hence, the number of tickets issued is fixed at that figure. Seeing a golden opportunity to raise revenue, the city of Boston levies a per-ticket tax of $5 to be paid by the ticket buyer. So we specifically have a tax on the consumer, where the consumer is writing a check to the government. It says Boston sports fans, a famously civic-minded lot, don't think that's entirely true, dutifully send in the $5 per ticket, it says, draw a well-labeled graph showing the impact of the tax, and then asks about where the tax burden falls on the owners, the fans, or both. So we want to understand this. And basically, the point that this problem is trying to make is where the tax burden falls when we have supply that's what's known as perfectly inelastic. Because if we were to draw a, su a supply and demand diagram, we'd start just like we usually do, quantity on the horizontal axis, price on the vertical axis, but then we don't just draw our normal upward sloping supply curve and downward sloping demand curve, because at least over the course of a season, having a higher ticket price doesn't make more tickets actually appear, right? That maybe over the course of a few seasons, the park adds new seats, you know, we see that happening, they're adding seats in every possible location, they have some plan to try to move, add seats across the street, something weird like that. But within the short term, we have supply that is fixed, that's unresponsive to price. So what we were to see if we were to draw a supply curve is that the supply curve basically looks like this. And we say that this is just fixed basically at 39,000. But we do have a downward sloping demand curve because lower prices do make more people willing and able to go see the Red Sox. So if we were to put a demand curve on, maybe it looks something like this. And from what I can tell, it's currently baseball playoffs. So from what I can tell, this true equilibrium price, if there were an equilibrium where there weren't secondary markets, would be about a bazillion dollars. But let's just pretend that we have some sort of equilibrium price that's actually being charged. And we're told that there's going to be a $5 tax placed specifically on consumers. Now we learned before that under certain assumptions it actually doesn't matter whether the tax is on producers or consumers, but if a question specifically tells you that a tax is on one party, might as well draw it to be consistent in that way. So what we're saying is that if this $5 tax is placed on consumers, we can think of this supply curve, this supply curve is in terms of the price that the producer is getting. Because that's really what the producer cares about at the end of the day, and that's what the producer is using in order to make economic decisions about how much to supply. Similarly, this demand curve is a function of the price that the consumer actually pays. Because, under certain assumptions again, this is what the consumer cares about when deciding how much to purchase. If they're taking into account the post-tax price and saying, is that too much for me, or am I going to pay that? then it makes sense that this is the functional form for this demand curve. Now the problem is then that our equilibrium isn't actually between these two curves themselves because they're in terms of different prices. So what we can actually think about doing when we're shifting this demand curve, when we're putting this tax on consumers, is what we're really doing is we're putting the demand curve in terms of the price that the producer gets to keep. So here, we're actually going to see something that looks like this. And graphically, what we're doing is we're shifting the demand curve down vertically. So now we're talking about a vertical shift. We're specifically not talking about a horizontal shift like we usually do. That we're shifting this curve down by the amount of the tax, which is $5. And the reason for that is now we're saying that we have this called D prime. There's a function of the price that the producer gets to keep. And the reason we can say that is the following. Like let's just take these two points here and say at this quantity, 
this original price was say $100, okay? So if the consumer was paying $100 for a ticket or willing to pay $100 for a ticket, what that actually means is that they're willing to pay the producer $95 for that ticket because that other $5 is going to the government. So what this is saying is, well, if the consumer is willing to pay $100 inclusive of the tax, that they're willing to pay that minus $5 specifically to the producer. And that's actually why we get this shift down by the amount of the tax. And we would do that for every quantity and we would just get this parallel shift. So now we actually have two curves that are in terms of the same price. And we can say that the equilibrium is where the quantity supplied equals quantity demanded at that price. So our equilibrium quantity is actually here. And we can pull this over and we can say, well, which price is this? Well, since both of these curves were in terms of the price of the producer, that this price is actually the price that the producer gets to keep net of the tax. And we're also interested in what price the consumer pays inclusive of the tax. Well, it's just going to be this plus $5, which is the amount of the tax. So we could look here and just go up by 5. Say, oh, hey, look, when we go up by 5, since the vertical distance between these two curves is always $5, we actually hit this point here. I could label this, two, this point here in one of two ways. I could label it as the price of the consumer or the demand price once the tax is in place. Or, you'll notice, I could label it as the original P star before the tax was put in place. Because the original P star was just at the intersection of this original demand curve and the original supply curve. So this is what we have our situation looking like. Let's think about the questions we were asked. It says, on whom does the tax burden fall? Well, what we're essentially seeing now is that the consumers are not actually paying more than they were before because of the tax. That their price inclusive of the tax is the same as the price before the tax. And the price to the producer is just $5 less. So basically what this is saying is that if the city put a $5 tax, even if it was logistically on consumers and people buying the tickets, the market would adjust such that the ticket prices went down by $5 to make up for the fact that consumers were paying $5 to the city government. And the reason that that happens is precisely because of this inelastic supply. That I worked for a professor one time that used the phrase, whoever can run from a tax will. And what that's supposed to mean is that the more elastic party, or the more price sensitive party, whether it be producers or consumers, will end up paying less of that tax burden. And here, we have perfectly inelastic supply. So when we have perfectly inelastic supply, these guys are never going to run from the tax, so that, or they can't run from the tax. So they're going to actually end up paying all the tax, or put another way, eating all of the tax, or in more precise terms, bearing all of the tax burden.